Aparuta de Sangamatasa Tawara, ye Sodavanta Bamujantu Satang. So I'm listening to the sound of silence. Nothing's coming up. <laughs> uh, this is uh, like a paradox, or you know, it's it's. Uh, this is one, one reason why many of us, I think, are attracted to Buddhism, because it offers uh, different ways of looking at the same thing. So, in the dualistic structure of thought, it's usually uh, black and white, good and bad. And then, uh, then in the more Asian formulas for thinking, it's good, bad, uh, neither good nor bad, both good and bad. I just think that gives you uh, much more way of, of uh, looking, different interesting ways of looking at paradoxes. And, and because the thinking process, uh, that's why I keep emphasizing that for you to contemplate what thinking is. Not think about thinking, but, but, but observe it, what thinking is as, a, as experience. Because it is one of our obsessions. We're, we're very much thinking creatures, thinking animals. Uh, we, we're quite clever at that, and we can use logic and reason and, and uh, complicate everything with our thoughts. Because thinking is, is dualistic, and that tends to cause increasing complications. Everything it's separative. So when you start separating, uh, dividing into two, then into uh, fours, and on and on and like that, things keep separating, com complicating, complexities arise. The more you think, the more complex everything becomes. So in uh, you know like. The uh, Buddhism can pre be presented as a very complicated teaching, and you look at some of the tomes written on 
on Buddhism and you're and you kind of freeze in your tracks because <laughs> you know you look at one as volume that thick all on non-self. <laughs> how can you how can you write that many words about nothing? <laughs> And yet, on the, on the, uh, you know, yet we're capable of doing it because it's, a, you know, it's published by wisdom. (laughs) 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 So it's, uh, you know, the more you and we can we can create abstractions and and theories and and we can we you know thinking is quite entertaining. Uh, you know, if you have a clever mind, you can entertain yourself a lot with your clever thoughts and and um, ways of using thoughts and language and and uh, writing poetry and and whatever, kind of creative forms of thinking, original thinking, repetitive thinking, <laughs> whatever. But thinking is, you know, is, is something we learn, something we develop. It's our education. We, when we start going to school, we, we acquire knowledge from others. So you learn the ABCs reading, writing, arithmetic, and all the rest into uh, complicated uh, intellectual developments later on. But, uh, so this is, there's nothing wrong with this, this is not a criticism, but just pointing to that thinking itself uh, is something to really recognize and contemplate without thinking about thinking. Otherwise, you'll write one of those thick volumes <laughs> that nobody will read anyway. Um, uh. So this is why, like reflecting on thinking, that's this, this why deliberately thinking uh, and listening to, watching yourself think. This I found most enlightening for me. <clears throat> so, you know, think anything you want. I am, I am the worst uh, monk in the whole Sangha, or I am the best. I, mean, I am a fully enlightened Arahant, or I am a hopeless case, been monk 40 years, and, and all I'm doing is just watching my breath. Somebody was saying that they, they were sitting there and, and uh, the other day and this, the thought pops up in his mind, suddenly he starts thinking, so for no reason, I'm Fred Kroll. <laughs> and it wasn't Fred Kroll. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that come from? Uh, even, even he was wondering, you know. He doesn't seem to, generally doesn't seem to have that thought go through his consciousness. <laughs> Do you have any of those experiences? The kind of most kind of bizarre or strange thoughts just suddenly appear. And they, where did that come from? And, uh, you know, who knows? It, you know, if you kind of worry about it or try to develop theories of me. Am I, am I trying to be Fred Call or <laughs> do I have a secret? <laughs> and you can suspect anything you want if you know if you're in the mood for doing that. But, but uh, this is where awareness is recognizing it is what it is. So some thoughts are absolute nonsense in terms of what they're saying. You know, they make no sense, or they're, they're anachronisms, they're, they may, they're in, in no context, but they just suddenly appear. And we, we tend to 
to have ways of filtering these things out, the bizarre, the unwanted, the, the kind of uh, illogical nonsense and things. And because we generally, you know, we edit our, even our thought process. I remember, you know, the more I started practicing mindfulness, developing awareness, then I began to notice that a lot of the very silly thoughts, stupid, what I would consider nonsense, or stupid thoughts, or things would arise into consciousness. And uh, and I wondered why. Why why is this? Uh, you know, because you know, for one thing, I. I, I would easily make judgments. I think that's a stupid thought. And I don't like to think of myself as stupid, you know, my ego. You know, I like to think of myself as an intelligent person. So probably, you know, these stupid thoughts just are overlooked by, you know, when they come up because, you know, you, you, you have this way of just dismissing information that you don't want. Cognitive dissonance, it's called. Where you don't hear uh, anything that does that you don't want to hear, and uh, this is a problem I think with the government. And <laughs> <laughs> and you only hear the things that you want to hear that support your particular view of life and yourself. So, but in mindfulness, then uh, you know this uh, this cognitive dissonance is no longer, we're no longer inclining to do this because we're, we're not interested in supporting the ego and, and justifying ourselves in, in, that, in that old way out of fear and out of ignorance, but awakening to Dhamma. So then uh, kind of even maniacal thoughts, uh, crazy thoughts, irrational thoughts, nonsense uh, can, can appear in consciousness. And now our relationship to it is knowing it in terms of Dhamma, see? because the discerning ability is not judgmental. When we start judging, that's rubbish, that's maniacal, that's stupid, that's intelligent, that's good, that's a bad thought, then, then we, the ego is, is coming forth, you know, the sense of myself making value judgments about the conditions I'm experiencing. The thing that, that is most obviously true is whatever it is, it is what it is. And that's a, so obvious that sometimes you feel embarrassed saying it because we tend to, you know, want to make it more than that. Uh, want to define it, describe it, relate it to this and trace its history and, and, uh, and you know, form philosophies around it and whatnot, because this, this entertains us, also it can be interesting, and uh, this is what we're conditioned to do through education. <coughs> but it is what it is, is not, a, is not a definition, is it? But it's a reminder of looking, uh, of observing, of witnessing, in a very honest and direct way. Because it's not telling you what it is, not, not defining it or describing its value, but it is recognizing it is this, it is what it is. So, uh, you know, a bad thought, if you just, is just a thought, it is, it is what has this quality, but you're not interested in, in, uh, in, projecting that word onto it anymore because you can see that and, and discern it in terms of Dhamma. What arises ceases. The Sapa Sankara Nicha, the discerning wisdom ability. It doesn't mean we're in, you know, we don't see that, you know, that it, you know, that it is, uh, it can be right or wrong, good or bad, but, but w 
this isn't what we're encouraging to put our emphasis upon because with the critical mind, we're always putting our emphasis, we're giving so much significance to the fact that it's good or bad, right or wrong. So we get very kind of polarized in this dualism and then we judge ourselves with, with this same critical faculty. You know, so we, 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 we look at ourselves and we say, I'm good or bad or intelligent or stupid or uh, lovable or not. No. You know, this is on and on. We, we evaluate ourselves with this critical mind. But, it, but it, in, in terms of Dhamma, whatever way, whatever the qualities uh, or conditions we're experiencing, they are what they are. And, and our path then of liberation is recognizing this, whatever way you are, each one of us, you know, has our own karma to work out. You know, we have certain things in common, but so much is, is uh, you know, quite unique to ourselves, the way our particular memories and emotional habits and physical appearance and so forth is infinitely variable and different. So there's not a point of standardizing this and say everybody, you know, should, we'd like to fit everybody and make a clone and have a kind of, you know, a, a mass production of the perfect woman, the perfect man, where we'd all be perfect. Just try to imagine what that would be like. <laughs> if we all looked exactly the same then I wouldn't know, you know, just it would be a totally different world we create out of that. But, um, you know, why do some people, uh, why are they born with all the assets of beauty and, and so forth, and others are born deformed? Why, why do people, you know, why are people black or white or male or female or, or you know, frail or strong or whatever, these, uh, why do some, some, what, why, why are some born disabled as Down syndromes or with various other uh, disabling diseases and whatnot? Why, why is that happening? And then, you know, we think it's, it's not really fair. Why, why, if God really loved us all equally, why didn't he create us all the same? So we're all beautiful, all equally intelligent, clever, and and then we, we never, you know, we could grow old in a much more graceful way without wrinkles or anything. <laughs> you know, God can do everything, you know, anything. So <laughs> why, you know, was it, why did he create this mess? <laughs> So it does make you wonder because then the, the thinking mind, the creation is, you know, if I were God, I would have done it differently. <laughs> and then trying to justify the inequalities and the injustices and the unfairness. How do we justify that? And so then we say, there's no God, don't believe in that. And, uh, and then we, 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 feel we, we get caught in the opposite of denial. And, and not really wanting to look at it or understand it. So, with Dhamma, then, where I find this like the law of karma that that each one of us is working out. A karma. Now, this is this is using words, but it does give a context for accepting the the varieties and inequalities and unfairnesses in terms of the qualities of the five khandhas that we're experiencing at this moment. And, and, and then also we're not looking to a perfect human being that we must try to become as the path, are we? We're not, we're not trying to become this, this idealized, perfectly healthy, perfectly beautiful, perfectly intelligent human being that we could imagine and trying to make ourselves and remodel ourselves into some beautiful ideal. But with meditation we're actually awakening to 
the way it is, in which it is, we're not creating ideals of, of form, but recognizing form, conditioned phenomena, in terms of Dhamma, or Sape, Sankara, and Icha, all conditions, all conditions, all phenomena, all these separate things, bodies, uh, mosquitoes, horses, cats, dogs, birds, lice and fleas, uh, the grasses, the trees, the flowers, everything. Everything is that arises, ceases, that begins, ends, is born and dies. This is this way of reflect. Then we're looking at this changingness, like when we're observing thought or emotion or energy or uh, whatever you know the, the the body itself. We're we're noticing. We're looking at change rather than trying to project the idea of anicca or impermanence onto uh, into our minds. We're not grasping the concept of anicca and then projecting it onto the world around us, which sometimes people do that. They say, everything's in each other. And it's a way of dismissing things. They say, some are really, you know, really, uh, you know, sour grapes. They say, look at that, look at those beautiful flowers. And each other. They say in a few days it'll all be rotting and stinking anyway. <clears throat> that's projecting, isn't it? That's 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 just t- grasping the the word and and then projecting it on. They, you know, we don't. Those flowers are beautiful. We don't contemplate beauty as experience. We project if we think we're really good vipassana practitioners. Is the anicca. <laughs> But in terms of reflecting, like even uh, putting, bringing the flowers into visual consciousness, they are what they are. And then we can, in that context, we, we actually can enjoy them. It is not a dismissal or a judgment, but we're not asking that they be anything but what they are right now. So we're not saying, well, you know, flowers, you know what they're like. They, they look all right the first couple of days, and then you know, they, they aren't very nice anymore. They'll always be disappointed, you know. Why don't we get plastic flowers? And they, <laughs> they last longer, don't they? In fact, they last too long, you get fed up with them. <laughs> So, you know, in, in, in uh, like, the way it is, isn't, isn't, uh, isn't meant to be a kind of any judgment, but a, a, receptive, a receptive ability. So it, it also brings joy, like, like uh, in, uh, like, say, in May in England, when the, when the spring comes, you know, it's incredibly beautiful. Suddenly, all around you are these flowers, and there's these gradations of starts with snowbells and crocuses, and then daffodils, and then bluebells, and it builds up to you know, you know and, the, and it's uh, and all these beautiful colors and fragrances. So you you know, in contemplating uh, this spring, you know, you see like the colors and and you're, you're, you can, I can enjoy the beauty without creating it into uh, some kind of desire. Now this is awareness. Now if I'm just caught in, in my desire, I see a beautiful flower and grab it, and say, I want this, I want this. <laughs> and, and then you find you're not really contemplating, you're not really enjoying the flowers, you're merely getting hold of them, thinking that by, 
by, you know, making them mine, that, that that's fulfilling some kind of, you know, desire of, of I, they're mine now, and I can look at them, they'll be beautiful. And then they, when they start wilting and one on, then you just throw them out, you know, get rid of them. But uh, awareness includes beauty and, and ugliness. Like in, um, in years ago in Thailand, one time I, we, in the, some of the hospitals, they let us go and contemplate autopsies. They let Buddhist monks. So one time we went to, to a play, uh, Siri Raja Hospital, one of the big hospitals in, in the Thornbury side of Bangkok. And uh, <coughs> they, on a Monday morning, because on the weekends there's a lot of murders and accidents. So there's a lot of really grim, gruesome corpses to autopsy. So Monday, if you're going to watch an autopsy, go on Monday. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you know, this is my ghoulish side. (laughs) So we went on this Monday and then and then the man, the, the man in charge of the autopsy room says, oh, I have something special for you. <laughs> and, 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 and I thought, what does he mean by that? And, and he takes me to this special room, and he opens the door, and I nearly pass out with the odor uh, of putrefying human corpse before I even see it. It's really a horrible smell. And... Uh, and so I feel this resistance, like not wanting to go in because of the, the terrible putrid smell. But I make myself go in, and there's this, this uh, bloated corpse that had been found in one of the canals, you know, had been decaying for several days. And it, it was all bloated with, with um, worms crawling in it, through it, and so forth. And it, so it was really hideous. And of course, Thailand being tropical country, things decay very quickly. So it's in this room, and it's all bloated up with gas. And then you look at the ceiling, and you see where previous corpses have exploded, <laughs> and, they, and, they, <laughs> and the guts go flying up on the ceiling. You see. And, and then you start thinking, I hope that doesn't happen while I'm here. <laughs> But this was a a test of mindfulness, because (laughs) the the first reaction was, uh, let me out of here, I don't want (laughs) to. And then just staying with that, observing this this revulsion and aversion to this this, uh, rotting corpse, I, I could be aware of this, you know, staying with it, my aversion to it. And after a while, that aversion ceased. I became accustomed to the odor, and then I could, I wasn't being averse to the odor anymore, so I wasn't suffering from the, the, the odor, where when I was suffering, oh, God, it's terrible, it's dreadful, let me out of here. That's the suffering. The actual odor itself was bearable, and I didn't, after I stopped reacting to it, then I hardly noticed it. Then the, um, then the visual appearance of a human corpse. There's something very powerful about seeing a, a human corpse in that state, because we rare, very seldom get that opportunity. And so it, it was hideous, you know, the old grotesque and, and that with its bloatedness. You didn't know what age it was. It was a, a male, probably young, youngish male that drowned in the, in the canal. It, um, then after the aversion and the kind of proliferating tendencies stopped, then I began to, to really uh, observe the, the decaying process. And strangely enough, I found it quite beautiful, the way nature disposes of things. You know, the, the, my... The, my judgments of beauty and, and that were 
were created in a, on a certain level of, uh, you know, of convention. But in the reality, when the when the aversion and the disgust, the negative states left, then even this process of decay, you know, was was I didn't feel repelled at all. It was it was quite marvelous to watch. How this in life consumes and 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 takes away and 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 these things are recycled. You know, the human body is is recycled into the into the ecosystem and uh, and e- even noticing the colors and the and the kind of the, like the maggots and the worms and that instead of just seeing you know the natural reaction of, of worms and maggots is disgusting you begin to appreciate the the process of nature as it, it, in operation and the decaying process so it's it's like not only is, is can we learn from the beautiful in the enjoyment, the joy that comes from beauty, but also, you know, we begin to open ourselves to life itself and all that that includes, not just the the nice side of it and the, you know, the 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 polite and correct side of life, but the other also, old age, sickness, death decay, all that so much of our modern societies want to to uh, deny or shut us away from, not to allow anyone to know about it. <clears throat> when my mother died in 89, you know, and I was giving a retreat at the Angelus Center, and I had to leave in the middle of the retreat to go to the funeral in San Diego. So James Barris offered to come and take over while I was went to my mother's funeral. So I went down, flew down to San Diego. There was a Catholic. They were they were all devout Roman Catholics, and of course when I got there, the the, the coffin was all covered up with a kind of nice satin cloth over, and then the priest gave a kind of funeral sermon which was, made you feel good, you know, it was a, you know, how wonderful my mother was and that she's no doubt up in heaven with the Lord and that, that's obviously rather nice to think, you know, that she's, you know, that's where she wanted to go and that she's there. But being a Buddhist, I knew that nobody really knew what, where she was. <laughs> And I didn't even know if her body was in the coffin because I couldn't see it. <laughs> so then, uh, you know, but it was very cosmetic and and sentimental and, and made you feel kind of, you know, it, it wasn't depressing. You weren't really looking at death or examining your feelings or loss. You were, you were kind of getting sentimentalizing and, and talking about uh, you know how wonderful this person was, and now she's rewarded with this uh, being in in heaven with the Lord. And then they, then we took her to the her body to the uh, Catholic cemetery in San Diego, and uh, went in procession, and and they had it all set up, you know, where the hole was dug and had this kind of green false grass over the hole with a contraption over the hole and then they put the coffin on top of this contraption and then the priest came, sprinkled water and said a prayer and they were told to leave. So I decided I wanted to help bury my mother so I stayed and then the the men in charge of the grave diggers and so forth came up and they said, you have to go. And I said, well, can I help? You know, I'd like to help bury And they said, no, you can't do it. We can't lower it till everybody's gone. That's the rule. They all have to go. Then we can lower the coffin into the hole. <laughs> so, you know, this is how, how uh, Americans are being treated, like we're idiots, like we can't, <laughs> we couldn't take it. You know, if we saw the coffin going into the grave, 
we just faint, or it'd be so traumatic we'd spend the next 20 years in therapy. <laughs> because it's just beyond our ability to, to, uh, to endure such traumas. And yet, you know, in Buddhist terms, this is, this is a natural event, death. And the Buddha encouraged us to observe, to contemplate this. Like a lot of monastic practice is in Thailand is living in, in the charnel grounds or burying grounds. And funerals in, in the northeast Thailand where I live, they're, they're very meaningful because you're actually contemplating what's happened, you know, making it fully conscious. You can actually see the body. And, and it's not, try, they're not trying to make it look beautiful, you know, so they're not, they don't put lipstick and powder on it. And it's just, you know, an, a, a human body that's dead. And, uh, and, you, and you meditate on that. And, uh, and that, so you're making conscious this, this reality, death, uh, of the body is like this. Now this is not depressing. This was not traumatic for me when Ajahn Chah had his funerals. <laughs> I didn't faint and, and I found it very powerful experience. Uh, uh, you know, because one never had such opportunities in the United States to really bring into consciousness death and loss and really look at a, at a dead human corpse. <clears throat> so we, we live in a society that wants to deny and cover it up and, and uh, not mention it. You know, it's not polite to even say the word death in public. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is how, you know, we build up euphemisms and ways of talking that don't make it so, re so stark, so shocking. But in in awareness now, then this this awareness includes the whole process, from birth to death, from to the peak moment of life, to the to the best, to the worst, the 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 climb up and the slide down, and the whole lot is is reflected on and observed. And in that, then we, we free ourselves from the fears and the reactions and the, uh, uh, and the projections that we create around the flow of our lives, around our own bodies, around the loss of our loved ones. Because all of us have to experience loss. You know, you, everyone, isn't it? You have to see your parents get old and die and uh, your teachers and your, you know, friends. And at my age, you just, they're dropping like flies. <laughs> Seems like when I was young, nobody ever died around me. Now, like in England, all, all the time there's somebody dying. And, and we have this uh, temple in Amarbati, Chapel of Rest. I had them deliberately build this chapel into the temple where we can take the bodies up, you know, when people want to put the body, then we put the, uh, the corpse into this ch very nice room. And it has a reclining Buddha um, engraved in, in plate glass, huge thing, like the Polonarua Buddha of Sri Lanka. You know, that it was copied that, but, it, but engraved into glass, quite beautiful facing west. So in, in Buddhist terms, the west is where death takes place, where the sun sets. And then the reclining Buddha is also the, the dying Buddha, the parinibbana of the Buddha in the, the history of Gautama. Then it gives us a chance to contemplate this, because in England also is very much the same. There's it's all covered up politely and nicely and, uh, and euphemisms used so nobody ever really is reflecting and observing. Now I find when, when somebody dies, like when my mother died, you know, I was teaching a retreat 
she died very quickly. In a, I was with her the night before in San Diego, and uh, she seemed all right. In fact, she and my sister took me to the airport, flew up to San Francisco. The next morning, my sister phones and says she died. So, you know, it was a shock. But she was 88 years old, and, you know, she wasn't particularly healthy, so it wasn't, you know, one was kind of glad for her because life for her was getting increasingly more difficult physically, but it was a shock. And so this you can notice, like, then I had really looked at this feeling or lack of feeling. When you're shocked, sometimes you don't feel anything. And and just being able to to access this this the, the state of my jitta in the present means that I could really learn from this experience. Because, you know, it's a, you only have one mother and uh, and and when they die, that's that's it. You know, you won't have another. So I mean, you can adopt somebody as your mother, but I mean, the really only one mother, and uh, <laughs> my ancestral mother anyway. And then, you know, I love my mother. She's a very nice person. We, you know, was very good mother. So there's a sense of loss and and grief. This can be witnessed. I was with this feeling. I wasn't afraid of it or just trying to, to, you know, ignore it. But it it interested me, you know, to, to be there, to have this ability to, to really accept my feelings. Because this I had to train myself to do because the conditioning was the reverse. I've been, on a cultural level, I've been conditioned to suppress feeling, deny feeling, ignore it. So it's taken me, it's taken the kind of intentional, deliberate effort to, to really look in and, and, and observe and, and bring, allow these feelings into consciousness. And then you're seeing it in terms of Dhamma too. So, even though you're feeling it, you're not, it's not a grasping of the feeling, either through denying it or rejecting it or just wallowing in, in, in the emotion. But it, it is what it is. The suchness. It is what it is. Loss of one's mother, the death of one's mother is like this. And of course now it's a memory in, in terms of, you know, many years ago. But at the time where, where the, the, the suddenness of it, the shock of it, and the, and the funeral experience, I, you know, I was experienced enough and confident enough in meditation too to use this, this experience of loss in a way of, in terms of Dhamma. And then that, that is a very powerful experience, a strengthening of yourself. It gives you, you know, it, it, instead of, of the, the loss and the unpleasant side of life or the, the, the death or the decay, the ugliness, the unfairness, the misery that one experiences in one's lifetime, I found all of these you know, through awareness, is, is sometimes is some of the most powerful learning and strengthening experiences one can have. It's when, you know, you really have to determine to see something and, and, and recognize and open to, to that which, which is very, maybe emotionally fraught, very uh, powerful, very overwhelming, very frightening, very threatening. And yet, through this confidence of awareness and even the most threatening conditions or frightening situations are, you know, you, you begin to observe how they affect the mind, 
the heart, you know, what are you feeling? And it's not in terms of you feeling, you know, the right feelings, but the feelings are what they are. You know, how could I tell you you should feel a certain way? But whatever you're feeling, then only you know that. You know, you know, if you trust your awareness, you know that it's like this. And you don't need to have a word for it or define it in any way because it is what it is. So this is a direct knowing. This is satipanya, mindfulness wisdom operating, not cultural conditioning or the ego that's all, you know, very conditioned to to react in certain ways. You know, like cultural conditioning binds us to to what, you know, what's allowable, what should be done, what's acceptable to the society, what is punished, what is rewarded. We we can we you know, we we live in a society that brought up with reward and punishment as our conditioning factor. You know, you're rewarded for being good, obeying the rules, and uh, studying hard, and you're punished for breaking the rules, being disrespectful, and not studying. At least I was. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, from this conditioning process, you, you learn survival, how to survive in the society, so you you know you, you a lot of effort is trying to make yourself acceptable uh, in a society where uh, you can be punished and hurt and rejected. You know so polite manners and and uh, you know developing ways of surviving and and getting on in the society, being praised and admired because the other is uh, you know we're frightened of the other. But we still, after all this conditioning, we don't know who we are. Am I this nice little boy that 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 uh, has uh, that's been taught good manners and and is socially acceptable because I I never say uh, rude words and <laughs> I never offend anybody. I'm always, you know, you know, I always uh, do it saying the right thing and acting in the right way. Or the naughty one, you know, the loose cannon, you don't know what they're going to (laughs) do. You let those into your house, you're you're in for it, because they might (laughs) say anything or do anything. So this is, uh, you know, how how we are programmed. We have so many problems, like in England these days with with violence and drugs, unemployment, uh, you know, children, teenagers, without fathers and and things like this, uh, just in, and then drug addictions and drunkenness and um, gangs and uh, all the rest. It's uh, you know quite. You can see that that the society, you know, by giving so much attention to material development because Britain at this point is affluent, very good economy, politically stable place. But socially it's very confused. Because we don't, you know, we think this is a nuisance, all these these refugees and uh, immigrants and, you know, all these concerns about you know, trying to to control everything and stop all this uh, drug addiction. But in terms of, you know, everybody wants to, to punish or do something to stop it, but not really understanding what the basic problem is, is ignorance, not understanding Dhamma, uh, and, and just operating from cultural habits. Class, uh, class conditioning. You know your identity with your. In 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 England, they're more identified with the class. With the with the working class or 
they have lower middle, they have middle and upper middle, and they have upper. In America, I don't think we make that much of a differentiation. I always thought all Americans were middle. Seem to be, anyway. But then, uh, I don't know what it's like these days, but these are identities, isn't it? What you identify with, you know, your ethnic group. Your, your sexuality, you identify with that. Now you, you tend to hold that identity and, and, uh, and fixate on that. So, you know, en endlessly we're binding ourselves to these conditions and we don't see what we're doing. We're merely institutionalized or programmed to, to seek identities in, 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 in these various... Uh, conventions or identities that we, we've developed. Now outside of all those identities is the awareness. Now the awareness embraces all of those. And it's not, uh, repeat many, many times, not a criticism of any of them, it's just they are as they are. Now it's not making a problem about them, but it's, 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 get, it's allowing us a, a view of them in which we know we can free ourselves from attachment, from fear, from identity, from resistance to the conditioned world, both in, inside our consciousness, or inside our mind or <coughs> externally. So this is, this is liberation. And in the it's interesting to see how, uh, you know, like when I talk about mindfulness as the path, you know, consciousness, what I've been saying is very direct the whole time when I started from day one on this retreat, whether you noticed it or not. <laughs> I haven't been beating around the bush at all. So, so that, you know, conscious, pointing out consciousness starting with what is boundless, isn't it? Now we're not used to, you know, the word consciousness usually, it, most people don't really understand it. You know, so it's, it's um, you know, there's so much, view, there's so many views and opinions about what consciousness is and how it operates and whatnot. So, and then Buddhists have different views about it. But, in terms of reflection, you know, right now, at this very moment, this is consciousness. You know, I don't need to, to d go to the dictionary to find out what, what that, how that defines consciousness, or to the Pali dictionary to find out the Pali definition of consciousness, because consciousness is this. So it's, you know, where is it then? You know, show it to me. It's this. Damn it. <laughs> Consciousness is like this. You know, and you can't find it. You are that. You know, like trying to, to find your own face. Where is it? I can't see my own face. I don't need to find it. Because it's here. <laughs> and I can see your face. I can't see my own face. Why is that? Why can't I see my own? I have a take a picture of me, you know, and then I can see a photograph of my face or look into a mirror. Is that my face? That's not, that's a reflection in a mirror. You know, you can poke your finger at it and it won't harm it. <laughs> you do that to your real face, you can put your eye out. <laughs> No, I mean, these are quite obvious ways of investigating reality. But, <laughs> but we have, you know, it's worthwhile doing this in order to, because what is closest and obvious and real is not noticed. You know, we can live in a, a totally artificial dream world, uh, abstract ideas and, and so forth that 
are totally, you know, out of touch with anything happening right now. So, in, in awareness, we are not doing that. We're stopping this, this fantasy life, these delusions, to awaken to the way it is. So, consciousness is this. And then, then this is a, it is the way it is. Uh, to me, this, this moment, when I'm just aware, then consciousness has no boundary. It, 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 it's infinite. No, it's immeasurable. In terms of experience now, this moment. I'm not talking about it in, uh, in abstract ways or scientific terms. I'm just talking about it from uh, reflective awareness at this moment. So then consciousness is, and then thoughts arise, cease, emotions, feelings, uh, physical sensations, sensory uh, in, impingements through sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, memory and thought. But this awareness then brings us in to, begins to allow us to recognize consciousness, the reality of consciousness is like this. Before I make my, I define myself as a person. So that's why it, it's like, uh, it stops the thinking mind. It's not, it's not to define and, and find myself or describe myself, uh, cling to the idea of consciousness. It's using the word consciousness in order to recognize this reality. It's here and now. It's not, I'm not unconscious, am I? Yeah. Talking. <laughs> so this is this is consciousness, is, and recognizing this, then you have, you know, from this point, then you can deal with the particulars, with the arising, ceasing of of thoughts and feelings and memories, emotions. You have perspective then, where if you don't know this, then we tend to endlessly move into the conditioned realm without any perspective on it. You know, we, we, our habit is to attach to it, to react, to, to like and dislike and approve and disapprove of the conditions, uh, both inside that we're experiencing and externally. So in, in this way, like... It, with, with, when the Buddha pointed out awareness, mindfulness, path to the deathless, is it, this is this is it. It's not a, it's it's a natural state. It's not you don't create it. It's not jhana or absorption. It's reception. It's openness. Except we never we never contemplate it and recognize it. It's not a value that our society has. Our society is very much one of absorbing, becoming, attaining and achieving. So from, you know, we're, we're conditioned to always be trying to get something or get rid of something, control something, improve ourselves, uh, try to control the world around us, make ourselves safe, get lots of home security and a lot of, you know, things to protect us. Burglar alarms and, and Rottweilers and... <laughs> Nowadays, in people, you know, you go to parts of wealthy parts of London, like Chelsea, they've got, they've got the most elaborate forms of television burglar alarms and everything. To, to, you can see them as you're walking along the street, just spend so much money just trying to stop people from robbing, burglaring their homes. They have big dogs and things like this. Protect me, build these walls to, to make me feel safe. Because we don't know. You know, we have to protect ourselves 
and and because of fear and the, and the, and and the, all the unknown possibilities of humiliation fear disgrace rejection failure now in this awareness successive failure no longer an issue because we're working out our karma so success uh, and people say you're you're a great monk, a successful monk, or they might say you're, you know, accuse me of all kinds of corruption and stealing funds and, and force me to disrobe and reject me. Say those are the two extremes. Could happen. But in this way, it, it, it isn't, that's not the point, is it? The awareness is the refuge, not the position. And this I really know, because in, in reflecting on success and failure, how my ego, it'd be very, I'd be very hurt egotistically to be rejected and, and abused like that. You know, I'd be shattered personally. I just couldn't bear it personally. But on a level of awareness, I can't. So what's there to fear then? You know, if, if your refuge is in awareness, where on a, in a pers- if I return and, and, and attach to my personality, then I'm, I'm limited to that. And that's very, my personality is very limited. <laughs> it's not a, you know, a personality that, that I trust <laughs> or that I even like. <laughs> I don't even like it, but, but it's, it's the karma that, I, that I'm living with. So it's in seeing it, you know, and recognizing it that, that um, I learn from it, from both the, the praise and the blame, success, failure, um, good health, bad health, uh, happiness, and suffering. So these are, they are the eight worldly dhammas. And and this Lung Po Cha used to emphasize this all the time in, in our life in when I lived with him in Thailand, this, seeing this, you know, seeing the not the favor either, you know, of equal value. Praise, blame of equal value, he'd say. Say Tao Tao Gan means same the same thing, you know. Success, failure, happiness, suffering. Tao Tao Gan. They all you know, then don't 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 favor one over the other. Well, this is this is of course developing upekar equanimity, but not indifferent, not a kind of blasé, kind of cold uh, uh, indifference to anything. But it's a real engagement, a real profound recognition of the way things are. So it's not to try to blur everything into a kind of, it's the sankaras out there, and, you know, I try not to even, you know, I don't want to be attached to any of them. That's being theoretical again. That, uh, you know, this, is, so it's not a, it's not grasping the theory of Buddhism, but it's, it's re- awakening to the reality of Dhamma in the here and now. So, that's enough for this evening, some of the notes. Hope I've covered some of them. The air conditioning in the hall. (laughs) It says, I vote for it, but I'm only one of many non-existing folks. (laughs) And then... uh, on sound of silence, quite a few. And then, um, this is my mother is extremely neurotic and soon to be 80 years old. I'm going to see her in a few weeks after years away. Any suggestions? She. <laughs> She drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, my suggestion is uh, look at your mind, you know. Uh, don't, don't anticipate. 
you know, if you start thinking, oh, I've got to go see my crazy mother after this retreat, then you're, 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 you know, you're priming yourself. You're, you're kind of winding yourself up. Just trust your awareness and let it happen and not, not uh, project or anticipate. Then, um, on jhanas, I've answered that, haven't I? Not necessary. (laughs) (laughs) And here's one. I've been a closet and weekend tobacco smoker for years. It is a great pleasure to smoke. What do you think about this behavior? <laughs> I don't think about it. Tandamaya, <laughs> <laughs> Sadhu Kayam Dadamase Sadhu 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 Anuadam We can close the the evening with the um, chant on the Brahma Viharas. We'll do the Pali version. So that's page 30, Suffusion with the Divine Abidings. Andamayang chaturapamanya ho basanang Karoma se Meta sahagate na jeta sahegang Jetasa vipulena mahagatena 
Sun. 